Welcome to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen and I'm the host of the show. It is filmed here at Chabot College in Hayward, California, under the auspices of the Chabot Las Positas Community College District. The concept behind Interesting People is that there are interesting people everywhere in everybody's family, neighborhood, and community. And our country is truly rich with interesting people and interesting stories. Today I have a guest named Jack Cheevers on the show here. Jack's a very interesting person and he's done a very interesting book. Uh, on our show, he's a former reporter for the Los Angeles Times and he attended the University of California at Berkeley and then he spent 27 years as a newspaper reporter and editor here in California. And we'll be focusing today on a book that he recently published called An Act of War about the capture of the USS Pueblo in 1968 by North Korea. Uh, and his book has relevance to today and in the future because of a lot of things, including decision making about what to do under uh, a difficult uh, situation with a Navy ship and uh, military activity, but also relevant to North Korea today that is uh, showing acts of, um, uh, shall I say, boldness, shall I say, in the, in the Pacific. He began his research on the book in the year 2000, which included several interviews with Captain Lloyd Booker. Uh, he interviewed many of the crew members and members of the uh, President Johnson's administration that were involved in dealing with the crisis over the USS Pueblo. He also used the Freedom of Information Act to obtain documents from the Department of State, U.S. Navy, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the National Security Agency. He also obtained documents from South Korea, the former USSR, and from the Eastern European bloc. He now lives in Oakland, California here with his wife, Kat. Welcome to Interesting People, Jack. Thanks, Tom. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for being on the show. What I'd st like to start with, Jack, is let's go back to the year 1968. What was going on in this country and the world at that time? Well, the Pueblo was captured uh, early in 1968 on January 23rd. Uh, but uh, 1968, of course, was one of the most tumultuous years in American history. There was a, an extraordinary number of things that were going on in this country. The Vietnam War was near its peak. Uh, in, uh, uh, shortly after the Pueblo was captured, the Tet Offensive took place uh, in South Vietnam where the communists attacked uh, targets throughout the country, the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Uh, President Johnson announced in March that he was not going to run for a second term, which shocked people around the world, actually, at that time. Accordingly, I shall not seek, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Uh, uh, you recall uh, the, uh, uh, Martin Luther King was uh, murdered. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, in color, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening, Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, in uh, April of 1968, Bobby Kennedy was killed in June of 1968. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. Just after he'd won the California presidential primary, uh, the Soviet Union inv invaded Czechoslovakia. August the 21st, 1968, Soviet tanks roll into the center of Czechoslovakia's capital city, ending what had become known throughout the Western world as the Prague Spring. Uh, that year, uh, and at the at the very end of the year, the Apollo 8 uh, astronauts circled the moon. Frank, I think I can say without contradiction, there's been a mighty long dry spell up here. I guess you can say anything you like without contradiction. So it was an extraordinary uh, time. You're right, and I'm old enough, and you're old enough too to remember that period of time, uh, and. And that was a period of time, too, when we were deep in the Cold War, obviously, as you were expressing, and also a period of time when um, there were doubts that the West would prevail against the East, and particularly the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union and communism was really on a roll at that time. And so it was a very difficult and intense period of time, which I remember very well. And uh, 
tell us how you got interested in the subject of the Pueblo and uh, what, what catalyzed your interest? Well, as you mentioned, I'm, I, I'm a longtime uh, journalist and I was actually looking for a topic to write a book about and I'd done some research and rejected a couple of ideas and I was still really uh, very anxious to find something that, uh, that I could work on. And I was living in Los Angeles at the time and, and there was this uh, coffee house near my apartment uh, and I used to go there on the weekend and they, uh, they had great coffee. They also had used books for a dollar. Uh, and I was there one Saturday morning and I noticed a, a copy of the memoir that Captain Booker had written uh, after he came home from North Korea. It was called uh, Booker, My Story. And I paid my buck for it. I went home. I figured I'd just read a couple of chapters, you know, Saturday and get into my, my weekend routine. And I just uh, couldn't put the book down. I was fascinated by it. And it talked about his, it was an autobiography. It talked about his childhood. Uh, it talked about his, how we get into the Navy. It, it talked, all, talked all about the Pueblo mission and, and uh, his imprisonment in North, uh, North Korea. And it was just, uh, it was a fascinating read. And I realized that, um, uh, two things. One, that uh, a lot of the crewmen, a uh, number of the crewmen were, st were still alive at that time and um, were living in Southern California. So I had kind of easy access to meet them and interview with them. And uh, I also had the advantage of using the Freedom of Information Act to try and dig out uh, secret documents that had been in an archive or in a safe somewhere for 30 years thir or 35 years and publish them for the first time. And, and that was a big advantage I had in, in uh, writing about the Pueblo as well. Can you describe to the audience and myself the ship itself, the Pueblo? What was it like? What was its uh, size? And what was the nature of the ship? Well, it was a pretty small ship. It was only 176 feet long, which is very small by Navy standards. Uh, it was actually an old Army uh, freighter that had been very hurriedly converted into a, a, an electronic surveillance ship, a spy ship. And uh, it had been uh, commissioned in the 40s. Uh, so it was, it was eight, by 1968, it was kind of an older ship. Uh, and uh, it was uh, very lightly armed. Uh, there were only two 50 caliber machine guns. The crew had uh, a, a handful of small arms, uh, Thompson th submachine guns and, and rifles uh, that they could use. But it was, uh, it was a pretty small ship and it was very lightly armed. And it was, uh, when it was restructured, shall we say, what was it designed for? What was its purpose then? Well, it was outfitted specifically uh, to do intelligence work, to do electronic surveillance. Uh, so it was it was jam packed with all kinds of uh, electronic sensors for picking up uh, radio uh, and radar uh, signals. Uh, it had um, uh, a variety of code machines uh, and material for programming the code machines on a daily basis. Uh, it was loaded with all kinds of classified documents, uh, maintenance manuals, uh, secret intelligence reports that uh, had been radioed to the ship by by the Navy. Uh, during the course of its journey. Uh, uh, so its, its specific mission um, was uh, to, uh, it was going to be based in the Far East. It was actually home ported in Japan. And the thinking was that it, would, it could be used to uh, do surveillance uh, on the Soviet Union, the ch uh, China, and North Korea. And it turned out that North Korea was its, actually its first and its last mission, as it turned out. Mm -hmm. Jack, when we were talking earlier, I referenced being on, uh, taking a trip on a freighter and going through the uh, uh, North Pacific in 1975 for six weeks and uh, had a uh, shortwave radio. Uh, could pick up hardly anything on that shortwave radio except Russian trawlers. And I asked the captain of the ship, I said, is there anything out here but Russian uh, presence? And he said, well, there's not much, and he said they're all over the place here because they're spying on us and, and military and commercial activities. So was the Pueblo and our involvement, was that sort of a reaction to the Soviet presence in the Pacific doing uh, surveillance on us? Yeah, absolutely. It was, the Pueblo was, was commissioned as part of a, of a top secret Navy operation called Operation Click Beetle in the mid-60s, mm -hmm. and it was directly a reaction to the Russian trawler fleet. Uh, and the Russians um, were using these you know, fishing trawlers, uh, loading them with, with eavesdropping equipment, and they were, you know, they were doing surveillance on our Navy all around the world. Uh, they were keeping tabs on our aircraft carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin. 
uh, as they launched aircraft toward North Vietnam. The Soviets would warn the North Vietnamese that the bombers were on the way. Uh, they were keeping tabs on our nuclear submarines going from bases uh, in Guam and South Carolina and Scotland. Uh, they, were, they were keeping tabs on us all over the world. And there was a real rivalry, r rivalry at the time between the Soviet Navy and the, uh, and the US Navy, um, particularly in the Pacific and the, and the Mediterranean. The Soviets were starting to expand their Blue Water fleet. Uh, the Navy was very concerned about that. So there was a gentleman uh, at the Pentagon at the time uh, named Dr. Eugene Fubini who was, saw what the Soviets were doing and he wanted to do something in response to that. And originally he wanted to have 70 American spy ships, uh, but only three were commissioned, I think partly because of budget problems during the, during the Vietnam War. And the Pueblo was, was one of those three ships. I see. Now you described the ship, I think it's about 175 feet, you said, mm -hmm. in length, and mm -hmm. how many crew members were on the ship? There were 83. There was a large number of, of uh, crewmen on the ship. And what was the crew, what type of crew members? Did they come out of other parts of the Navy? What was their, their general background? Well, it was a unique ship because it was doing electronic surveillance. So there were 30, 30 uh, members of the crew were called communication technicians, and they were very highly trained specialists who operated all the surveillance gear, and they worked in a special part of the ship behind a locked door, a locked steel door. Uh, and uh, they worked, you know, literally back to back. Their chairs were back to back in this very narrow corridor, uh, and they worked 24, you know, 24 hours around the clock, uh, trying to pick up radar and radar signals. And the ship was assigned to uh, the first mission was to uh, go to North Korea and to uh, do eavesdropping on radar and radar stations along the North Korean uh, eastern shore. Uh, and and uh, uh, to measure the radar signals, the, si the shape and, uh, of the signal and so forth, and get all kinds of technical information to figure out exactly where the stations were, were located so that in the event of war between the United States and North Korea, uh, our warships and aircraft could attack those stations uh, early on and try to blind the North Koreans about what we were doing, take, out, take away their ability to detect our aircraft approaching their shores. Mm -hmm. Now, tell our audience and myself about uh, Captain uh, Pete Booker. What was he like? You well, interviewed him several times. Yeah, he was, he was a very interesting man. Uh, he was uh, 40 years old at the time the, the Pueblo was captured. Uh, he was married. He had two teenage sons. Uh, he was a career Navy officer. He'd actually started out at the end of World War II as an enlisted man. Uh, had gone to college at the University of, uh, of Nebraska and come back into the Navy as an officer. Uh, had risen through the ranks, uh, had undergone um, submarine training, uh, become an executive officer on uh, three submarines that were uh, that operated in the Far East uh, during the late 50s and early 60s, and uh, did surveillance missions themselves. Uh, so he would uh, one of the missions he he went on one time was uh, to spy on uh, the uh, Soviet Navy uh, in the port of Vladivostok in Siberia. Uh, and uh, keep a tab on the on the Soviet fleet, uh, and uh, 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 they would um, track Soviet missile tests. The Soviets were just starting to br um, bring uh, missile firing submarines online, uh, so the our submarines would would watch the launches of of the missiles, measure the you know the telemetry of the missile, for, you know plot where it went down in the ocean, so it'd figure out the range of the missile. Uh, so he was a very interesting guy. He was a very intelligent uh, man. He'd been um, he'd been orphaned uh, as a very young uh, young child uh, uh, and adopted by a couple in uh, Idaho during the Great Depression. Uh, his adoptive mother soon died. His, his adoptive dad was an alcoholic who went to prison, uh, and uh, uh, Captain Booker um, was sent to Long Beach uh, to live with his grandparents for a while. Uh, but was eventually sent back to his dad when he got out of prin uh, prison. Um, and uh, the dad was an alcoholic and was uh, living in a shack by the Snake River with a bunch of other transients, uh, hard drinking transients. Uh, the dad was eventually put back in jail and at, at the age of seven, uh, Buka was homeless and uh, you know, was foraging through you know, garbage cans around Pocatello, Idaho, uh, uh, sleeping in cardboard boxes at night. Uh, he was finally arrested uh, by the police. He was, uh, they caught him stealing fish hooks at a five and dime store mm -hmm. because he was fishing in the Snake River uh, as a way of surviving. 
and he ran around with a bunch of other little kids who basically, you know, were pretty unsupervised. There was no adult supervision. So he's, he was arrested. He was finally uh, put in a, uh, an orphanage, a Catholic orphanage in northern Idaho, uh, which he loved for several years. But then he, one day he read about uh, Boys Town, which was in Nebraska. Boys Town, of course, is the famous refuge for abused and abandoned boys. Uh, made famous by the movie of the same name starring uh, Mickey Rooney uh, that came out probably in the late 40s, I would guess. Uh, and um, Buka was a, um, he was a bookworm, uh, but he was also uh, big into sports. He was a football player and he heard that um, uh, Boys Town had a terrific football team. So he talked his way into Boys Town and actually entered, uh, uh, got on a train from uh, Idaho and, and arrived in Nebraska in 1941. Uh, right before uh, Pearl Harbor took place. Mm -hmm. He eventually graduated from Boys Town, uh, went into the Navy, uh, but he was a very intelligent guy. He, was, uh, he loved life. Uh, I think it's partly because he was an orphan. He was really deprived as a kid. He, he craved human contact, uh, which became a factor, I think, in the way he handled his crew uh, later on. Uh, he loved to drink, he loved to party, he loved women. Um, uh, he, he, uh, he, he, he was very well read. He kept a, a collection of uh, Shakespeare's works in his, his cabin on the ship along with his collection of Playboy magazines. <laughs> uh, he was quite a character. He had a, a, a photographic memory when I, when I talked to him. I, I met him when he was in his, his 70s and, and uh, he died a few years later. But uh, he was a very lively, uh, intelligent, uh, fun-loving man. Interesting. Before we get into the incident itself when the North Koreans uh, captured the ship, what type of preparation was the ship? You referenced it was armed, uh, but what the ship itself and the crew were were they trained at all to in anticipation of the possibility of a adversarial action such as did emerge? Were they prepared or were they not prepared? No, they were very unprepared, and that's why this whole disaster unfolded. Uh, there was at at the time in the late '60s there was basically a gentleman's an unspoken gentleman's agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union that if you don't interfere with our spy ships, we won't interfere with yours. Um, but the North Koreans didn't play by those rules, uh, and and that was the problem. So the the crew was never um, really trained to deal with to to repel borders. Uh, the Pueblo was not designed for a pitch pitched battle at sea. It was very lightly armed, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, um, about half the crew had never been to sea before. Uh, they were very young. They were, most of them were in their early to mid-20s, uh, and, and uh, they were completely un unprepared for what happened. A lot of people on the crew didn't even know that they were going to, to North Korea until they arrived. And the equipment that was on the ship, they were not really prepared what to do with the equipment, with the documents, in case something were to happen. Is right. That I mean, th this ship, as I mentioned earlier, was just loaded, literally loaded to the gunnels with, with top secret equipment, uh, state of the art electronic surveillance equipment, code machines, um, very uh, complex uh, pieces of machinery. And the only way the crew had to dispose of that was literally to break it apart with sledgehammers and uh, fire axes while under fire, uh, which wasn't a particularly good plan um, as, as uh, history proved. Okay. Before we get into the incident itself, uh, we're going to take a pause here for a brief public service announcement. When a disaster strikes, time is a killer. The hours following are critical. The UN Central Emergency Response Fund jumpstarts relief efforts which saves lives. Help us help in time. Donate now at rapiddisasterrelief.org. Welcome back to Interesting People. And uh, my guest today, Jack Cheevers, who's the author of the book, Act of War, about the USS Pueblo that was uh, captured in 1968 
by, the, by North Korea. Jack, as we were talking earlier, let's move into, you've described the ship, you've described the captain, the crew, the period of time we were in with the Cold War, very intense period of time. So let's talk about the day when the incident ha actually happened. Can you start to tell us what happened on that? The ship was, uh, it had, had been sailing south down the, the, the coast of North Korea. And on that particular day, it was opposite a port called Wonsan, which was uh, a major North Korean military installation. There was a, a, an airfield there that had probably 75 MiG fighters stationed at it. There's a North Korean naval base there. Um, uh, and the, the, the ship was about 15 miles offshore, so it was well into international waters. Uh, and it was, it was dead in the water. The crew was listening for signals, and they were, for the first time during the cruise, they were actually starting to pick up some signals from the North Korean military. And it was about, uh, about noontime, and the, the captain and, and a, a part of the crew were actually having lunch. And uh, he got a message from his, uh, from the uh, officer of the watch uh, that uh, a North Korean ship was approaching at high speed. The Pueblo, in describing the incident, said that a North Korean SO-1 class subchaser, pennant number 35, had been encountered at 12 o'clock noon Korean time. As the SO-1 class subchaser approached, Pueblo took a radar fix to verify her position. This position was reported as Pueblo's 12 noon position and put her 15.8 nautical miles from the nearest land, the North Korean island of Ungdo. Uh, and he didn't, you know, he wasn't particularly worried about that. He had been warned uh, during the briefings for the mission that the North Koreans might come out with, with their ships and harass him and sail around him and point their guns at him, but that's as bad as it would get. So he kept uh, uh, eating his lunch. He told the, the lookout, you know, if it gets any closer, you know, keep me abreast of what's happening. And the ship come, get, kept coming closer and closer at high speed. And finally, it was, it was, it was very close to the Pueblo. And uh, the captain went up to the, the flying bridge. And it turned out to be a North Korean uh, submarine chaser, uh, which was armed with uh, a 57 millimeter cannon uh, and a number of uh, machine guns. And it started circling the Pueblo. And in the meantime, several other uh, gunboats came out. and. Uh, uh, very quickly, the Pueblo was surrounded by six uh, gunboats, two submarine chasers, and, and four uh, torpedo boats. The Pueblo, in describing the incident, said that a North Korean SO-1 class subchaser, pennant number 35, had been encountered at 12 o'clock noon Korean time. As the SO-1 class subchaser approached, Pueblo took a radar fix to verify her position. This position was reported as Pueblo's 12 noon position and put her 15.8 nautical miles from the nearest land, the North Korean island of Ungdo. And there were two MiG fighters uh, overhead, and one of them fired a missile, which missed the Pueblo, which went several miles away and, and hit the sea, but it was clear that the, the, the fighters were, were armed. Uh, and the, the North Koreans uh, started uh, signaling the Pueblo, and the first signal was, what's your nationality? And Booker uh, ran up the American ensign and uh, uh, the, the, the North Koreans then indicated that they wanted the, uh, the Pueblo to, uh, to uh, follow them into their port. Uh, and uh, they had their, uh, their guns uh, manned and pointed point blank at, at, the, at the Pueblo. Uh, the captain um, uh, noticed that one of the, uh, the submarine ch uh, uh, chasers was transferring armed soldiers to one of the PT boats which then started to, it reversed its engines and started back, backing toward the Pueblo. And it was clear that the North Koreans were going to, uh, or were going to try to board the Pueblo. Motor torpedo boat 604 is backing toward the bow with armed landing party attempting to board. Pueblo all ahead one third right full rudder departing the area under escort. Intentions, depart the area. And so at that, at that point, uh, Captain Booker decided to run. Uh, and he hit, uh, he, his orders were to, uh, to uh, if he had to withdraw, to do that with dignity, to do it slowly, don't do it in a panic. So he just started gradually increasing his speed. Uh, the ship was very slow. It, it had a top speed of only 13 knots. Uh, uh, the, the North Korean boats could go as, as fast as 50 knots. Some of 
At 1.26 p.m. and 1.28 p.m., the operator transmitted, they plan to open fire on us now. For the next hour, the North Koreans fired on the Pueblo with both 57 millimeter guns and machine guns. Subsequent reports from the Pueblo and the North Koreans stated that there were four wounded aboard, one of whom later died. The, the, the torpedo boats could, could achieve 50 knots. So there was no way that the, the, North Korean, the Pueblo could outrun the North Koreans. Uh, uh, they were much uh, better armed than the Pueblo. Uh, and uh, Buka was determined to get away, and the, the North Koreans opened fire on him. And all of a sudden, his ship is being peppered with cannon shells and machine gun fires by, um, by several of these, of these gunboats. And uh, uh, one of the shells hit a, uh, a mast above the flying bridge and showered him and some, uh, a couple of other crewmen with shrapnel. Uh, uh, he was wounded uh, in several places on his backside and his leg. Uh, he kept going, and uh, eventually uh, one, of, uh, one of his most, most trusted officers uh, uh, started screaming at him, are you going to stop this son of a bitch or not? He just started screaming at him, and uh, uh, Booker um, uh, basically just uh, at, at, the, at that point uh, felt that he, he was surrounded, he was outgunned. Uh, his, some of his crewmen were, were, uh, were injured. There was no way he, es he could escape. Uh, he thought the North Koreans might, he originally thought that they had, had mistaken him for, as a South Korean ship, and as soon as they realized he was American, they would let him go. Uh, so he did stop the ship. Boarding was first mentioned when Pueblo reported at 1.15 p.m. that a boarding party on motor torpedo boat 604 was attempting to board her. At 1.29 p.m., Pueblo reported for the first time, quote, we are being boarded, unquote and Pueblo repeated that she was being boarded on two subsequent occasions at 1.30 p.m. and 1.38 p.m. We now know that there were no North Korean personnel aboard the Pueblo until 2.32 p.m. when Pueblo reported have been directed to come to all stop and being boarded at this time. Uh, and the North Koreans uh, boarded him at that point. And uh, he was to become notorious in the Navy for surrendering his ship without a fight. Uh, he didn't fire a single shot, a shot in self-defense. Uh, it was the first time a United States Navy commander had done that since 1807 during the Nepole Napoleonic War. This chart is a compilation of all available information on the positions of the units during the seizure. Uh, and so uh, at that point, the, uh, the North Koreans um, told him to follow them uh, follow them into the, into their harbor, and uh, Booker started proceeding again. He was trying to go as slowly as possible. Uh, his men were uh, they were uh, they were trying to destroy their equipment. They were starting. They were trying to um, uh, they were trying to burn their classified paper. They were trying to destroy the machine the code machines as much as they could. I, I'm sorry, I got this a little bit out of order. The ship hadn't been boarded at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so they continued into the, into the port very slowly, frantically trying to, de to destroy this equipment. Uh, and uh, uh, Booker actually went below and saw that they were you know, not making much headway. There were piles of classified paper. Uh, they were you know, trying to use sledgehammers to, to bang up this, this classified, the, the code machines and so forth. It was very difficult to break the machinery up. It was very well made. Uh, so he thought he would try and buy a little more time by stopping a ship, which he did. North Koreans immediately started firing you know, cannon volleys at him again and one of his sailors was actually hit in the groin by a, a, a cannon shell, which nearly uh, severed his leg. It was a 19-year-old sailor uh, named Dwayne Hodges from, from Oregon, and he just literally bled to death on the deck. Uh, there was, by, by, at that point, there were 10, 10 sailors, including Booker, who were wounded. Uh, two of them had pretty bad uh, leg wounds and were hemorrhaging, uh, and, um, and he just he uh, at that at that point uh, uh, the North Koreans were signaling him just to uh, to uh, start up the ship again. Uh, they later put uh, they boarded the ship. They brought a pilot uh, onto the ship and they took him into Wonsan uh, uh, under escort. And they arrived that evening uh, and uh, they were. They were, they were uh, treated very brutally uh, on board the ship and when they first arrived in North Korea, uh, and they were uh, pretty quickly put into uh, North Korean prison at that point. 
Now, when they first were aware of the fact that there was a vessel, a North Korean vessel, approaching them, apparently, from what you've indicated, was there not a protocol in place for the Pueblo or any other uh, spy ship like that to notify higher ups that there was a possibility of something transpiring? Transpiring. Well, yeah, they were in touch with their home base, they which were, was okay. in uh, in uh, Yokosuka, Japan. Okay. Uh, by radio, and uh, the radio operator was trying to get information from them. You know, what secret equipment have you destroyed? What haven't you destroyed? Uh, the um, uh, the military was was uh, frantically trying to figure out what to do. Uh, there, uh, the um, the air force was trying to get some planes uh, into the area. Uh, which proved impossible, some fighters to, to deal with the MiGs and try to drive away the North Korean gunboats and basically break the Pueblo free. That wasn't possible. Uh, it turns out that the uh, USS Enterprise, uh, the nuclear power uh, carrier, was in the general vicinity. It was about 500 miles south of the Pueblo, but that's a fairly quick hop if you're in a supersonic jet. It was about an air, uh, about an hour's uh, flight time from where the Pueblo was. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, the Enterprise actually started preparing to launch uh, combat aircraft to try and rescue the Pueblo, but they received uh, orders from uh, their superiors to stand down, uh, to back off, uh, and to not engage uh, the North Koreans. And, and that leads into what, uh, what President Johnson's thinking was at the time. So at, at this moment, when uh, it's the first time that an American naval vessel did not uh, fight back, since 1807 and is captured, surrenders to the North Koreans, and then they're taken into North Korea. This is, in, as we were talking earlier, the year 1968, right in the height of the Cold War, one of the most difficult years in the Cold War. So there's a lot of tension. So can you pick up from there when then the White House was notified and the State Department and what their reaction was? Right. Well, it was uh, Washington, of course, is in a, in a different time zone, and uh, Johnson was sound asleep. It was the middle of the night. It was about 2.30 in the morning, and his national security advisor, Walt Rostow, uh, came in and actually woke him up. Uh, he felt it was serious enough a matter to wake up the president in the middle of the night. Uh, and uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, Johnson really had his, his hands full with uh, the Vietnam War, and the last thing he wanted was, a, was another uh, war in Asia. Uh, so I think fairly quickly uh, he and his advisors made the decision uh, not to use military force against North Korea, but to try and negotiate uh, the return of the crew and the ship with the North Koreans. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Johnson wanted to assure South Korea that uh, the United States was still willing to back them up if war did break out over this. It was a very tense time uh, uh, there. And so Johnson... Um, sent, uh, a, 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 there was a huge buildup of U.S. military power in the region. Johnson dispatched about 350 combat uh, aircraft to the area, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, sent a naval armada into the south of Japan. Uh, uh, the uh, Enterprise was joined by about 24 other ships, including two other carriers. It was this huge military uh, buildup. Um, and the, 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 the situation was just, it was just like a tinderbox at that time because only two days before the Pueblo was captured, uh, the North Koreans had actually sent a, a team of commandos into Seoul, which is the South mm -hmm. Korean capital, uh, with, uh, they were under orders to uh, invade the Blue House, which is the uh, South Korean presidential mansion, uh, and to uh, assassinate uh, President uh, Park Chung-hee, who was a, an ex-army general, very tough guy. Uh, their specific orders were to decapitate him, to murder his entire family, and then to exfiltrate uh, back across the demilitarized zone to, uh, to North Korea. There were 31 uh, men in this team, uh, very highly trained. They'd been training uh, for this mission for two years. They were armed to the teeth. They were all in their 20s, very fit. Uh, and they were... Uh, literally uh, marching down the middle of a street in, so in Seoul, about a half mile away from the Blue House, they were disguised as South Korean soldiers when they were finally challenged by a, a, a suspicious, a suspicious so uh, South Korean cop uh, who said, who did you guys say you were again? 
and uh, their, the nurse, their nerve snapped at that point, and they, they shot him, and they scattered in all directions. They were throwing hand grenades all around the place. They, they killed a bunch of South Korean civilians. Uh, so uh, the South Korean uh, military and the American military went into action and ultimately uh, tracked down and killed all but two of these raiders. Only two of them were believed to have actually escaped and gotten home. Uh, but you can imagine that the tension uh, at that time uh, uh, President Park was uh, extremely angry at, South, at North Korea. He was drinking heavily. He was terrified that uh, his beloved only son might have been killed in this raid, much less you know, his entire family would have been killed. Uh, he actually ordered his generals to prepare to march north. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the U.S. intelligence found out about that. So President Johnson was faced not only with the capture of one of our naval vessels, but the possibility that war would break out uh, between North and South Korea over this commando raid at the same time. Great, Jack. Now we're going to take a pause for a, a brief public service announcement and then renew with our discussion. Thank you. Will I always be working weekends just to stay out of debt? He's a great college for our kids. Out of the question? Is the American dream? Out of our reach? Not if we can help it. We're the National Endowment for Financial Education, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping people just like you get smart about their money. Log on to smartaboutmoney.org today and start taking control of your financial life. Welcome back to Interesting People We're with my guest today, Mr. Jack Cheevers, who's author of the book, The Act of War, uh, about the capture of the USS Pueblo by North Korea in 1968. Jack, I'd like to ask you a question that uh, I want to clarify a little bit. When the original ship was approaching the Pueblo and then other ships from North Korea came, do you feel that they knew this was an American spy ship? And because we're right in a very intense period of time in the Cold War, it was a very dangerous and risky act. Did they know what, exactly what they were doing or was there something else to this story? Yeah, I think they knew exactly what they were doing. One of the things I unearthed from the, um, the National Security Agency is uh, uh, intercepts. I mean, they were listening to what the North Koreans were saying on, to each, each other on, on their radio uh, channels. And uh, they marked it as a U.S. ship uh, right off the bat. As they were approaching it, they knew it was a U.S. ship. They knew it was a communication ship of some kind. Uh, so th I, I think there's no question that, uh, but that they knew it was an American ship. Okay. Was there an awareness at, in Moscow or Beijing about this activity as it started to take place, or were they caught by surprise too? I think the, the, the Soviets were shocked by what had happened uh, and very alarmed by it because uh, they, at the time, they had no interest in provoking a fight with the United States on the Korean uh, Peninsula, and they, they, were, they, were, they were worried as much as Johnson was that this whole thing would mushroom into another war. Uh, so they really call, tried to cool down North Korea, uh, but the North Koreans are, are very uh, independent, they're very, um, uh, they're very prickly, uh, and they didn't take a lot of direction from, from Moscow. They, they had their own uh, agenda, and they pursued it pretty mm -hmm. strongly. Interesting. And Beijing was not uh, in the loop either then on this matter, do you feel? They, they were only to the extent that they're always very concerned about what the United States and South Korea are doing because it's so close to their borders. Uh, but they, uh, they, didn't seem to, uh, they, don't, they didn't seem to reach out to uh, uh, North Korea the way the Soviets did and try to get them to, to pull back. And the, North Korea, the, the Soviets' position was they wanted North Korea to give back the crew and the ship as soon as possible and eliminate this whole problem. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now let's pick up when they, they're brought to North Korea, accompanied by the North Korean military vessels, and they're brought ashore. Are they at this point... Uh, prisoners of war? Are they hostages? What, when, what transpired from the time that they were taken to North Korea? Well, that, that's a really interesting and complicated question. Uh, uh, technically, um, the, uh, the United States was still at war with North Korea, uh, even though the, you know, the, North, the uh, Korean War had ended in 1953. It ended not with a peace treaty, but with an armistice. Uh, so uh, there was technically a, st a state of war existed. Of course, there was no hot war between the United States and North Korea at the time. Uh, but the North Koreans uh, regarded the, the, uh, the, these Navy sailors as spies, as civilian spies, uh, and they threatened them with execution. Uh, the North Koreans, uh, their, 
uh, their propaganda line was that the, uh, the Pueblo had intruded, had violated in their territorial waters, which was not the case. The Pueblo, as far as I can tell, at all times stayed in inter international waters. Uh, and that the, the members of the crew were, uh, were espionage agents, but which they couldn't be considered under international law because they're uniform members of the United States Navy. So North Korea really did take a, a, a chance here because they were, based on your research, the Pueblo was in international waters. They knew it was a United States spy vessel. So they still took a very bold act here, right. uh, independent of Moscow and, right. and Beijing. It was, it was an incredibly provocative act. I mean, this is during peacetime. Uh, they shot up an, a, 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 a commissioned ship of the United States Navy in international waters and took the crew uh, hostage and tortured them for the next 11 months. But, but to elaborate with us now about when they were brought ashore and where they were placed in a prison. Was there more than one prison and were they divided up? And tell us about what transpired from that point forward. Well, the, the, the crew was, uh, was brought ashore and they were taken um, by train to Pyongyang. Then they were transferred to buses and they were brought to some type of prison, uh, which as far as <coughs> excuse me, I can determine was a, a North Korean military training base. Uh, and they were later transferred to a, to a second uh, uh, military uh, facility as well. But they were, they were kept as prisoners. Uh, and the North Koreans immediately uh, started torturing them and pressuring them to sign false confessions that they had intruded in North Korean waters and that they were engaged in espionage, that they worked for the CIA, which was not the case. The CIA had nothing to do with the Pueblo's mission. Uh, it was a joint venture between the Navy and the National Security Agency. Uh, they put, uh, they concentrated in the, uh, on the captain. They were trying to break him down as rapidly as possible and, and to use him as a propaganda uh, pawn. Uh, and uh, they put him under uh, extraordinary pressure just in the first 24 hours he was there. Uh, they um, they uh, told him they were going to, uh, uh, they forced him to his knees in a corner. Somebody stuck a gun to his head and said, we're going to blow your brains out in the next two minutes unless you sign this confession. And Booker was, was sweating. He was terrified. He was you know, murmuring, I love, my, I love you, Rose, referring to his wife. I love you, Rose, over and over again, uh, trying to, you know, desperately trying not to show how, how uh, afraid he was. And he actually withstood uh, that, that two minutes and refused to sign. And they clicked the, the hammer on the gun. It was empty. And they said, oh, you're really lucky. That was a dud, but we're going you know, to give you another two minutes. And they did the same thing to him again. Uh, I can only imagine what was going through his mind and how that affected him for the rest of his life. But again, he refused to sign the, the, uh, the uh, apology, uh, the confession. And so then they, they took him uh, to a, a dungeon uh, where uh, there was a, a, an Asian man uh, who was uh, st literally strapped to the wall. He was stripped to the waist. He was covered with blood. Uh, he was basically unconscious. He had been horribly tortured. Uh, one of his arms was broken. A bone was sticking out. Uh, he, had, he had chewed his lower lip to shreds. Uh, one of his eyeballs had basically been knocked out of his, out of his head. And, and they said, uh, this is what we do to spies. This guy is a South Korean spy, and this is, we're going to do this to, to you, you son of a bitch, unless you sign this confession and, you know, right now. Uh, and he, uh, he refused to sign. They were beating him. They were kicking him uh, all, uh, just relentlessly. They would send him to a cell for a while, then they'd bring him back in a couple hours, and the same treatment would resume. Uh, they threatened him and his officers. Uh, they brought him all in. They put him in front of a North Korean general who, who uh, said, you're, you're spies, and we're going to execute you at dawn. Uh, and, and that deadline passed. And, and Booker, find, the thing that finally made him crack was they said, okay, we're, gonna, uh, we're now going to bring in all the members of your crew. They had them in a room. They said, we're going to bring the members of your crew in one by one, and uh, uh, we're going to blow each one of their heads off, and we're going to keep doing it until you finally sign this document. And if you haven't, we're going we're gonna to kill every single member of your crew. And if you still haven't signed this thing at the end we're at, with 82 corpses around you, we still have ways of making you t uh, sign this thing, and we will. Uh, and your men will have died for nothing. And, and, and they said, now bring in, bring in the crewman, uh, the first crewman to die. And they brought in uh, this 19-year-old sailor. 
uh, and Bucher looked at the sky and he looked at the paper in front of him and it was, it was written, uh, he hadn't written it, would, had been written by some uh, North Korean who was obviously not a native English speaker, it was full, fill, filled with mangled grammar and bad syntax, it obviously had not been written by, a, uh, by an American. And he, he had to make a decision on the spot, you know, am I going to call, uh, call their bluff and see this guy, you know, uh, get killed right in front of me or do I sign this, this obvious pack of lies that nobody in the, in the United States is going to believe? So he opted, opted to sign the, the confession. Uh, but uh, the, the crew endured uh, phenomenal abuse uh, for the next uh, 11 months. So the, the North Koreans pressured them constantly for all kinds of propaganda documents and photographs and, and audio recordings that they could broadcast to the world and justify their piracy uh, on the high seas. Now, when Captain Booker signed the document, uh, my recollection is I believe it was there was a broadcast of this. Yes, it was it was broadcast around the world. Uh, they had photographs that their news agency released uh, that were printed in newspapers around the world. They they got quite a bit of mileage, propaganda mileage out of out of what they were doing. And what was the reaction in Washington D.C. then at the White House and State Department, and the Pentagon? Well, the, the, the Navy uh, immediately started uh, trying to figure out where the Pueblo was uh, when it was captured because the fear was that it had somehow intruded into North Korean waters. Um, that would not have justified under international law what the North Koreans do. Uh, even if, uh, if the Pueblo had drifted you know, within the 12 mile limit into North Korean waters, the, nor the only thing the North Koreans could do under international law was escort the ship back outside that boundary, not shoot it up and capture the crew. Uh, but uh, the fear was that you know the, nor that the ship had accidentally intruded, and that would give some you know some reinforcement to what the North Koreans would were saying. So the, the Navy did a very careful analysis of all the the intercepts uh, uh, of the of the North Korean gunboats, where they were, where the Pueblo was and uh, concluded that it was, it w was in international waters. And the North Koreans actually held press conferences where they put out falsified coordinates for the ship uh, that had been uh, uh, plotted by one of the uh, navigators on the ship, a uh, 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 young lieutenant by the name of, uh, of Ed Murphy. But Murphy had deliberately falsified the, the coordinates. He realized the North Korean uh, army personnel that were supervising him didn't understand uh, navigation. So uh, he put up coordinates that showed the Pueblo 30 miles inland or the Pueblo sitting in downtown Pyongyang. There are also two identical positions shown here, which when plotted show Pueblo to be 32 miles inland in North Korea. The North Koreans first alleged that Pueblo intruded into their claimed territorial waters at six points. The sixth is the point at which they say that they captured her. Examination of a photograph of the track chart provided by North Korea reveals that it is intended to represent an official navigational record of the track followed by the Pueblo during the course of her mission. Careful scrutiny of the photograph of the track chart reveals that this chart is not an authentic ship's record captured intact from the Pueblo, but a document manufactured after Pueblo's seizure using a blank U.S. hydrographic office chart. And he knew that the, that the Navy would pick up on that, which indeed they did. Uh, uh, anybody who understood navigation would quickly f uh, figure that out. And during the 11 months that they were held captive, did any members of the crew die in, 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 in the prison? No, miraculously, nobody died. Uh, some of the men uh, uh, suffered um, lifetime um, uh, health problems. One of the men uh, uh, lost most of his vision because uh, the North Koreans had the, the Americans on basically a starvation diet. They were feeding them rice and, and this very smelly fish that the crewmen called uh, sewer trout uh, and miserable vegetables. There was virtually no protein in their diet. Uh, one of the crewmen uh, who had been during the attack had been, uh, uh, had his testicles removed um, without anesthesia. And uh, that obviously was a lifetime disability for him, but uh, the, 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 uh, miraculously the, the crewmen all came home alive, except for the, the uh, young man who was killed during the attack. I see. We're going to take a brief, brief pause here and for a public service announcement and then come back for our last segment of this interview.
Hello? Hello? I've been on the street for a while. I've been on the street for a while. I've been on the street for a while. I saw your poster outside. I saw your poster outside. I ran away from home. I don't know what else to do. National Runaway Switchboard, how can I help? Call 1-800-RUNAWAY to make the connection. Welcome back to Interesting People with my guest, Jack Chavers, author of the book, Act of War, about the capture of the USS Pueblo in 1968 by North Korea. Jack, as we go back, the crew and Captain Booker, they're held for 11 months in prison in North Korea. Tell us about their release, how it came about and uh, after 11 months. Well, it's a very unusual story. Uh, the United States uh, had been negotiating uh, with the North Koreans in secret uh, starting very early in the crisis. Uh, by early February, we were carrying on these discussions, uh, which went nowhere for months. The North Koreans, uh, we, we presented you know, all sorts of different proposals that we would conduct an impartial inquiry. And if, any, you know, if we had intruded in their waters, we would offer our regrets. Uh, one proposal after another was rejected by the North Koreans. They, they wanted one thing and one thing only, which was a signed apology that we had violated their waters for the purposes of espionage, which, which was a complete lie. Uh, neither of those things happened. Uh, but that's what they wanted. They wanted that document. They wanted it signed by a high-ranking uh, United States government official, and they clung to that demand without, uh, without wavering uh, at any point during these discussions. And uh, finally, by uh, uh, the late fall, uh, the, the United States had basically run out of uh, diplomatic tricks, uh, run out of you know, uh, uh, negotiating gambits. And one of the people in the State Department who was involved with these talks was at home one weekend with his wife, and he was, he was just kind of grumbling. I said, we're just not, not making any headways with, with these guys. What are we going to do? They just insist on this apology. And his wife actually suggested uh, a solution that turned out to be the key that opened the door for the crew. And her solution was, uh, uh, you know, the, the American position had been throughout that we didn't, we didn't violate their waters, so we're not going to apologize for it. So the wife's suggestion was, why don't you uh, hold a press conference and say in advance that we're about to sign this document that is a complete lie, it's a complete falsehood, uh, and uh, the only reason we're doing it is to free the crew. Uh, and, then, and then sign the document and give it to the North Koreans. And this guy looked at his wife as if she was from another planet, and he said, that's nutty, that's crazy. That, how, why, how was that ever going to work? Uh, that's akin to giving a, a, a kidnapper a voided check to release their hostage. Uh, but she said, you know, you've tried everything else, why don't you try this? And he said, okay, and he went back to his boss and his boss took it to President Johnson and Johnson said, look, if our negotiators in North Korea are willing to try this, I'm willing to try it. And it worked. Uh, and uh, because I think basically the, it worked because the North Koreans wanted a piece of paper. Uh, they could throw away the press conference where we denounced the piece of paper and they could just use the, pr- the, the piece of paper and put that on a TV screen and broadcast that to their people and say, look, we have humbled the great you know, imperialist aggressor. We've once again brought the United States to its knees. <coughs> Excuse me, we've triumphed over them. Uh, and they could broadcast that propaganda worldwide. And, they could, and, and that's what they really wanted. They wanted some kind of symbolic victory over the United States, uh, the great capitalist aggressor. Mm-hmm. And they gave it. And, and, and we gave it to them. And so uh, the, the crew was actually released uh, they, were, uh, they crossed uh, something called the Bridge of No Return uh, in the demilitarized zone, and they were f- immediately uh, checked by doctors in South Korea and flown home, and they uh, arrived home, believe it or not, in San Diego on, on Christmas Eve in 1968. And their, a lot, their families were waiting at, the, at uh, Miramar Naval Air Station, uh, which is a few miles north of San Diego, 
They'd just been notified the, the Navy that their, that their uh, men were coming home. They'd rushed to the scene from around the country. Uh, all three, there were then three, only three television networks were covering the return mm. alive. There were hugs, there were kisses, there were tears, there were screams of, of joy. Uh, it was a very warm homecoming, uh, homecoming for the men. And then there's a trial or a hearing. Yes, then uh, the Navy, uh, within just a couple of weeks, uh, can convene what it calls uh, a court of inquiry, which is basically a, a fact-finding uh, proceeding. It's held in public, and it's routine in the Navy. Whenever there's a, uh, uh, the, the loss of a, of a ship, uh, there's a, wherever there's a loss of lives, uh, the Navy, uh, quite correctly, I think, wants to try to figure out what went wrong and what can be changed to prevent future disasters like, like of that sort. Uh, so within three weeks of the, of the crew coming home, when they were still in a very shaky state, uh, the, the Navy convened the Pueblo uh, Court of Inquiry in uh, Coronado, California, which is right uh, offshore from uh, 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 downtown San Diego. It's a big Navy base. And uh, Captain Booker was the star witness. Uh, he testified for several days about his experiences in North Korea. Uh, and... Uh, uh, the Navy, uh, there were a lot of people in the Navy who felt that he needed to be punished, that he had given up without a fight. Uh, that's a sacrosanct rule in the Navy. You, you, don't, you don't do that. You go down with the ship uh, no matter what. Uh, and uh, a lot of people wanted him court-martialed in the higher echelons of the Navy. And uh, so the Navy listened. The, there were five admirals on this court of inquiry, uh, uh, men uh, who uh, very high-ranking officers with long experience in the Navy, very uh, talented men, very respectable men. Uh, and after a few days, the Navy publicly warned Booker that uh, he was uh, suspected of violating uh, Article 0730 which forbade uh, a, a Navy commander from allowing uh, his ship to be searched by a foreign power or his men to be taken prisoner by a foreign power. And uh, uh, you have to keep, keep in mind that the time frame, this was uh, April of 1969. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Vietnam War was very, uh, very, very intense at that time. Uh, there were literally hundreds of U.S. servicemen were coming home in body bags every month at that point. And the public was very weary of Vietnam, and that had a big effect on the outcome of the Navy Court of Inquiry with the Pueblo. Can you summarize how you feel? There, it seems like this was a no-win situation for everybody. What lessons were learned from this? Can you summarize what we've learned uh, from this experience? Well, the... Uh, the, 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 I mean, something that, that I learned from it, I, I, I thought it was a, a fa the, the, the court of inquiry was a kind of a fascinating collision of, of values. They're very deeply held values uh, uh, by many Americans. On the one hand, you have uh, the imperative that military people fight during wartime. When you're confronted with the enemy, you have to fight. Uh, if you don't, we lose the war. Uh, on the other hand, the public... Uh, uh, was very uh, uh, em empathetic with Booker's position. They felt that he was in a no-win uh, position. He couldn't outrun the North Koreans. He couldn't outfight them. Uh, the Pueblo wasn't designed for pitched combat at sea. And people understood that. And a lot of people were very angry at the Navy. They felt the Navy was trying to scapegoat Booker and his men for uh, mistakes that had been, been made at higher echelons in the planning of the mission. Why was the ship alone? Why wasn't there uh, a Navy destroyer escorting it? Why weren't there combat aircraft uh, nearby that could be um, scrambled to protect it if it got in trouble? None of that was done. The Pueblo was, was sent out by itself, a small, very poorly armed ship right off the coast of one of the most unpredictable and heavily armed regimes in the world. So a lot of people were very upset about that. And when the Navy publicly notified Booker that he might be court-martialed, there was a huge outpouring of of public anger. Uh, people sent letters and, and telegrams to the Pentagon, you know, why are you persecuting this man? You're, uh, you're going to kill this man, you know, back off. Uh, there, there was a big outcry in Congress. A lot of members of Congress were very upset. Congress started its own hearings on the Pueblo. Uh, 
uh, and uh, newspaper commentators, columnists were condemning the Navy for, for going after Booker. Uh, so the ultimate uh, decision by the Navy was made by the, uh, the Secretary of the Navy, a, a gentleman by the name of John Chaffee, uh, who was brand new in the job. He'd just been appointed by President Nixon. He'd been in the job for uh, about four or five months uh, at that time. He was a, a moderate Republican. He'd been the former governor of Rhode Island. Uh, and he was a combat veteran himself. He'd been a Marine company commander during the Korean War. So he knew the military and he knew uh, what uh, the, the stresses of, of wartime were like if you faced them yourself. And uh, he made a very, uh, uh, in my opinion, a very shrewd compromise uh, uh, at the end of this two-month hearing for Booker. Uh, the, the admirals on the, on the court of inquiry recommended unanimously that Booker be, be court-martialed and that, uh, uh, but uh, uh, Secretary Chaffee said that uh, he was not going to uh, impose any further punitive uh, proceedings against Booker or his men. Uh, uh, and he, he made the famous uh, comment that they have set, suffered enough, referring, of course, to their, uh, the attack on their ship and the, the uh, torture they underwent in North Korea. And so he basically, uh, he, 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 he refused to press any charges and uh, the men were never prosecuted by the Navy. Jack, it's uh, 2014 now with your research and your book on North Korea and the Pueblo incident. What uh, lessons or what things can be learned relevant to North Korea's behavior now in this, in this present period of time? Well, to me, it, it's just the, the idea that North Korea today is as unpredictable as it was in 1968. Uh, it's only that it's a lot more dangerous now because it's armed with nuclear weapons. That's very reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> now, you tell me when we talked that you, because you, know, you did a lot of research for this book, and you had to leave out some things about Captain uh, Booker's wife. Tell us quickly about his wife. Uh, his wife was wonderful, uh, a woman named Rose Booker. Uh, she just passed away last uh, fall. and. Uh, she uh, was a very traditional Navy wife, uh, you know, stayed at home, stayed at home mom, raising her two boys. Uh, and she was really transformed by this experience because uh, after it became clear to her that her husband wasn't going to come home immediately, she, she got very angry at the U.S. government. She felt the government wasn't doing enough to get her husband and his men back. Of course, she had no idea what was going on behind the scenes with the secret negotiations. Uh, so she basically conducted a one-woman crusade uh, across the country, uh, speaking to uh, radio and TV reporters, uh, rotary clubs, women's groups all over the country, uh, trying to pressure the government to do more uh, to bring uh, to bring the men home soon. So, so she's a, a heroine in this as, as well. She, absolutely, absolutely. Now. Tell us about Captain Booker, the, the rest of his life. What happened to him? Well, he, uh, he, was, a, he was a Navy commander uh, at the time he came home, even though he was called captain of the ship. His rank was commander. Uh, and he loved the Navy, and he wanted to stay in. He ho actually hoped to command a, a, another ship. Uh, be, eventually, it became clear to him, I think, that, that he was uh, radioactive. Uh, and uh, he... he he uh, was given an assignment uh, as the chief of staff for a minesweeping squad uh, based in Guam uh, during the, uh, uh, after the peace deal between us and the North Vietnamese went down. That squadron participated in removing some of the mines from Haiphong Harbor. Uh, but he eventually uh, realized that there was no way he was ever going to be promoted to captain, and he retired in uh, 1973. Uh, and uh, it was interesting because he actually turned to painting. Uh, in his retirement uh, and became a very accomplished uh, painter, uh, watercolorist, and has actually sold his, his uh, paintings for top dollar. Uh, and uh, he was still, uh, for, for decades after the fact, he was still a, a lightning rod uh, in the Navy, a very controversial figure. Uh, but he, uh, he died about 10 years ago, 2004. Uh, and he never wavered in his belief that he had done the right thing uh, in surrendering to, in order to preserve the lives of his men. And his men, uh, his men idolized him. They basically regarded him as, as a demigod. Uh, they realized the, uh, the cost to him of the decision he made to surrender the ship uh, and how it had cost him uh, his career. Uh, he'd done many things during prison to protect them and to try and improve the, the, the quality of the food and the medical care and the living conditions for his men, uh, even at the risk of his own uh, health and sanity. Uh, and they, they never forgot that. Was he bitter at all? 
Uh, absolutely not. He was a very resilient man, uh, uh, and he, uh, he, he, he. If, if you would asked him about the Pueblo, he was happy to tell you about it, and and happy to explain why he did what he'd done. Well, Jack, I want to thank you very much for being on the show today. Interesting people. You're an interesting person, and you have a very interesting book here, and you have a very interesting story about the USS Pueblo, uh, about what transpired, and it's an important book to read understand for whether we're civilians or in the U.S. military. So I want to thank you very much for being on the show today, Jack. Well, thanks. It's been my pleasure, Tom. Thank you.